So, grace and peace. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, and we have heard that today. It is the Sunday of hope. Now, when you take a look at the Christian calendar, it seems kind of goofy until you're familiar with it. There's four weeks called Advent, four Sundays that lead us to Christmas Eve. Now, these Sundays are not Sundays of celebration per se. There are Sundays of anticipation. There are Sundays of expectation. There are Sundays and days filled of waiting. And then there's Christmas. Not just one hour where we open all our presents, but 12 full days of celebration. Can you picture a 12-day party? 12 days of celebration, the 12 days of Christmas. I always thought the 12 days of Christmas were before Christmas. But the reality is on the Christian calendar, we have this build-up, this expectation, this waiting for four Sundays, four weeks, and then Christmas comes, and we don't celebrate it for just one day or one morning or one evening. We celebrate it for 12 full days. And so today, as we begin this Advent journey, we have this big party we're looking forward to, right? Not just one hour where we open all our presents and be done with it all and put away our decorations. But I would like in the back of your mind to picture a 12-day party, a 12-day feast, 12 days spending time celebrating the wonderful gift of Jesus Christ. Can you picture it, 12 days? Can you picture that, Dale, 12-day feast, 12 days of the greatest food ever? And as we discover today that that 12-day party of Christmas, the 12 days of Christmas, is there to remind us of the amazing Uh, marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven, this amazing feast, this amazing celebration that will take place in the new heavens and the new earth. When I think of Christmas as a child, there's one thing that comes to mind in the season before Christmas. It was something that I look forward to every single year. I would go to the mailbox and open it up and see if it arrived. You know what it is that I waited for as a child? This The Sears Catalog, 1975, I was seven years old when that came in the mail, because every year during the, I didn't know Advent season, during the weeks before Christmas, this thing would show up, and I would go uh, into my room, and I would get a marker or a pen or a crown or something, and I would go through, and I would circle all the toys that I wanted Santa to bring me. I was so excited about Christmas and getting presents. Uh, Some of the things that I remember circling in that catalog all those years ago, see if anyone remembers this gift. Anybody remember that gift? Yeah? Some of you like it. And this was, I mean, now in the age of technology, this kind of seems stupid. But anyway, back then it was awesome. It was these little figures that would go on this field, and the field was like uh, magnetic or whatever, and you would turn it on, it would vibrate. And those, and those football players would go down, yeah, it is kind of dumb, isn't it? But back then it was great because you could get the different teams and you could, you know, see if the football player would go. Anyway, I was uh, living in, in Dallas, Texas at the time. So, of course, I was a Roger Staubach, Dallas Cowboys fan. Um, I've since been, re- I've since repented and been converted of that. But back then I loved the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, in fact, I think that's what the one on top is. Another gift that I loved was Legos. Uh, man, I tell you what, I, I am so jealous of my brother-in-law. Man, when I was a kid, Legos were just these kind of kits, right, like this. Nowadays, you see what they come out with? My son-in-law has this big wall full of Star Wars, Millennium Falcon, and all this stuff. Man, but as a kid, we just put it together and use our imagination. Legos, and of course, a little bit later in the 70s, uh, the Star Wars, Star Wars figures were big on my radar. So my mom used to take me out. We would go to Target and try to see if we could get the missing pieces of our Star Wars collection. But I loved going through that uh, Sears catalog and dreaming of the gifts that I wanted. But here's the thing. I like presents, but life has taught me that presence is greater than presence. Cancer has taught me that presence is greater than than presence. Getting older has taught me that presence is greater than presence. At the end of the day, 
we remember the quality of time that we spend with our family and friends much more than we do the gifts that we open on Christmas morning. Amen? Another memory, a memory of my childhood was the fact that I did not like to wait for Christmas morning. I wanted to open those presents as soon as they are wrapped, as soon as they were under the tree. I would be the one shaking them, trying to figure out what it is. I'd beg my parents, can we just open one, just one present, can we, ahead of time? But I hated waiting. Does anybody here like to wait? I mean, is, is there seriously anybody alive that likes to wait? No, I don't want to open the Christmas presents early. I want to wait. It's, it's hard to wait, isn't it? I tell you what, when I stand in line at the post office during this season, I'm like dying, right? Or how about when you're at the stoplight sitting behind an accelerator challenge driver and then the light turns green? I mean, or when you go to the gas station, this is, this is what the works. You go into the gas station, you're waiting behind somebody to get to the pump. They pump their car, get the gas, and then they decide to go in to the convenience station and shop for 30 minutes before they come out and move their car. Anybody? Ah! I hate to wait. Waiting is so difficult. Do you like to wait? Or how good of a waiter are you? Today is the first Sunday of Advent. The word Advent means arrival. And so, to a certain degree, we are looking backwards and looking, uh, looking at the arrival of Jesus as a baby born uh, in Bethlehem. And then we are looking forward to Jesus' second arrival, the second advent, uh, which we call his second coming. As I read the uh, scriptures this week, the intersections, the themes of hope and waiting were woven in all four of the passages. And so this season of waiting that we call Advent, the title of this sermon on the first Sunday is called Waiting with Hope. Waiting with Hope. Uh, Advent reminds us to wait with hope because God is with us. Advent reminds us to wait with hope because God is with us. Our scripture passage that was read, Sam, thank you for reading it, uh, from Luke chapter 21, verses 25 to 36 this is a passage all about the signs uh, that were coming, about the coming destruction of the temple. Uh, Jesus is using apocalyptic literature. These things, these signs of the heavens and the dismay among the nations, they shouldn't be taken literally. There isn't going to be uh, the moon and the stars are going to fall from heaven. These are signs, these are figurative language to help us understand that the world is falling apart. And Jesus is saying in the midst of all of these signs, he's going to come as the Son of Man on a cloud of s in splendor. And all the disciples should keep watch, ready to read the signs and keep their hearts faithful. Now, so in order to really explain this crazy passage from Luke 21, we need to put together a timeline. So I'm going to come down here and we're going to do a timeline from one side of the sanctuary to the other, so we can kind of unpack this passage. Now, we'll say right over here is creation. This is the beginning of the Bible. The first two chapters of Genesis tell us how God created. He created all things and called them good. And he created human beings and called us very good, right? He created us and as his image bearers. We are created to reflect God's goodness into the world. That's who we are. Uh, we are created to have a right relationship with God the Father, right relationship between one another, right relationship with ourselves, and a right relationship with creation. And when all of those things are in order, the Hebrew people have a word for that, and it's called shalom. It's peace. God intended this to be this way. He desires to dwell with us and have a relationship with us and us to serve him as a kingdom of priests. So this is creation. This is where it starts. But it doesn't take long before human beings rebel, right? And we call that the fall. If we remember when we, last year we did the story of God series, we kind of went through the Bible chapter by chapter uh, or act by act. Then we talked about creation. Then we talked about the fall. When sin entered the picture, everything began to unravel. All of God's goodness began to unravel. There's this downward spiral. It starts with Cain and Abel, and then it goes, just goes downhill before, and it seems to spread throughout society to the point where we get to the flood and everything's a mess, right? And God's like, what happened, right? 
what happened. And that's the way that sin works. It's like a disease. John Wesley called sin a, a virus. It just spreads and it just it destroys civilization. It unravels. Now, it's interesting. In Luke chapter 21, the passage that Sam just read, I'd like you to pay attention to some of the things that Jesus mentioned. Jesus mentioned that the stars, the moon, and the sun were giving um, alarms to the people that, uh, that things, uh, the sign of the time. So there's, he talks about sun, moon, and stars. Well, in creation... In the creation, uh, God placed the sun and the moon and the stars in a particular way. But in Luke chapter 21, it seems like those things are falling apart. Another thing that says in, in Genesis, it says the Holy Spirit, this is Genesis chapter 1, the Holy Spirit is hovering over the waters. And one of the themes within all of the Bible is that the waters or the sea equals chaos. So anytime you read waters or sea, it means chaos. And so when the writer of Genesis, Moses, said that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters, it was this reference that God is over the chaos, that God creates beauty out of chaos. God is the chaos tamer. But when we get to Luke chapter 21, the waters are raging. The waters are raging. It's almost as if Jesus is saying that all of God's good creation is being undone. Creation is being reversed. It's being uh, uh, unraveling. All the goodness of God's creation is being unraveling. And that water rising and raging kind of reminds you of Noah, doesn't it? Kind of reminds you of what happens when violence takes over, when the, the sin of Cain becomes the sin of humanity. And when we take a look outside, when we take a look on the news, what do we see? We see that the sun and the stars and, and the uh, moon, not literally, but figuratively, are screaming at us that something is wrong in our world. And so there needs to be some sort of hope for some sort of uh, redemption. And so we fast forward to the end of the story, all the way over here. Hi, Trina, how are you? Over at the end of the story is the last two chapters of Revelation is the story of new creation. So we have creation in the first two chapters of the Bible. And in the last two chapters of the Bible, we have new creation. In other words, God intervenes and remakes and renews his creation. That everything that was there in the beginning has now been fixed in the end. Jesus says he's going to make all things new. We see the heavens and earth are resurrected and we see that God is dwelling with human beings uh, just like he did in the garden. So we see God fixing all the things that sin destroyed. If you're with me, nod your head. Creation, new creation. This is the timeline that we live in. So uh, in this it says, uh, Jesus says there would be no more pain. Doesn't that sound good? These old bodies of ours. No more pain. No more death. God would wipe the tears from our eyes. This is where it's all headed. Not somewhere out there, but a remade, renewed earth right here. And so this is the timeline of Scripture. First two chapters, last two chapters. Not accidental, by the way. Not accidental. First two chapters, last two chapters. So they're the bookends of Scripture. So Jesus shows up somewhere in the middle, we say. His birth, there in Bethlehem, in uh, born in such a way to uh, be on the margins in the midst of the Roman Empire. Uh, here's this baby born. God comes in the form of a baby, and we'll celebrate that on Christmas. But what we see here is through his life, his teachings, his death, resurrection, and ascension, that he, everything that he was doing, was repairing all of that fracture and unraveling of creation. He was healing the sick. He was uh, casting out demons. He was teaching about how to live in such a way to renew all things that were broken. It's called his kingdom, right? And so he was telling us how to be co-laborers with him, image bearers, in such a way to repair that which is broken around us. We say it this way, may God's kingdom come in Columbus as it is in heaven. May people here see less death. May people here see less pain. May people here have God wipe away the tears from their eyes. 
This is the invitation that Jesus invited his disciples and by the byproduct invite us into to be people who are a part of the restoration and repairing and renewing of all things. So this is the first advent, the birth of Jesus. This is the arrival of Jesus. And then if you go to that last part again, new creation, this is when Jesus comes back. This would be his second advent, his second arrival. So we have first advent at Christmas, and we have the second advent at his second coming, uh, the new creation. So where are we on this timeline? Jesus was born here, and Jesus is coming back here. We're somewhere here, right? That's where we are. So how do we live here? That's what this season is about. It's about looking backwards at the Christmas story and the season leading up to the birth of Jesus. And it's also looking forward to his second advent. It's looking backwards to the first advent. If you're with me, nod your head. Right? It, and then looking forward with hope to the second advent. That's what advent is. Looking backwards. So we talk about the Christmas story. We talk about John the Baptist and pre, the precursor to Jesus. We talk about all those things. And Mary's song and all of those things. To help us understand how to live now in anticipation and waiting for this second coming. So here we are right now. And the scriptures teach us this week that we need to be people who are waiting with hope. Waiting with hope. Now, there's two reasons why we need this. We need to wait with hope because Jesus, God, is going to come back and make all things new. So we live with hope. We believe that this is going to happen. It might not happen in our lifetime. In fact, uh, throughout history for 2,000 years, everyone thinks it's going to happen in their lifetime, right? It doesn't. Apostle Paul thought it was going to happen in his lifetime. It didn't. So we hope that it's going to happen in our lifetime. But regardless of when it happens, right, we live in hope that God is going to make all things new. He's not going to blow this thing up. Remember he said at that Noah thing? Remember he said... Uh, I'm not going to destroy the earth again, so I'm going to give you a rainbow, right, to remi remind us. In other words, God puts up his bow and arrow. That's what a rainbow is. It's a, there's not a Hebrew word for rainbow. It's a, it's a bow and arrow. God puts up his bow. No more violence from God's point of view. God's not going to commit any more violence, right? He puts up his bow. So every time we see the rainbow, it's a reminder that the God that we worship is not a violent God, right? He put up his bow, right? And so when Jesus says in that passage that the Son of Man is coming on the clouds, it's almost a symbol of Jesus being that rainbow. It's almost a symbol of saying that Jesus is coming to fix the things that we did, not to destroy what we did. And so we wait with hope because God is going to renew all things. So we partner with him. We participate with him. We fix Thanksgiving dinners, right, Sarah? For 600, and she's not recovered. Her and John are still asleep in the back there. Uh, but I mean, my goodness, that is, that is, right? That's what we're talking about. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus, right? It's, it's fixing Thanksgiving meals. It's buying a gift for the hands and feet ministry. It's doing whatever. It's, it's loving on our neighbors. It's, it's being present. And by, by doing that, we participate in such a small way in the repairing of all that God desires to fix in his second coming. We're, we're, we hasten the day of his coming. We participate in such a way. We lean in such a way. We have hope by living a particular way. The opposite is just being pessimistic and saying the world's going to hell in a handbasket, right? We as Christians live with hope that God's going to fix it. He's not going to destroy it. The second thing we do is we, we wait and hope because God is with us as we wait. Now, I'm not sure what you're waiting for in life right now. I would imagine all of us are waiting for particular things. But the idea of Advent is that God is with us, Emmanuel. God is with us as we wait. We're in this spot between the two Advents, but we're not alone. That God is with us as we wait. So his presence is with us. Now, here's the thing that I am realizing is that as we wait, God is shaping us and forming us to become people who reflect Jesus more and more. Here's an example. As we wait in the line at Walmart, 
when there's only three registers open on a Friday night. As we wait in Walmart, what is God doing to our soul? God is forming us and making us to be more patient. Right? In other words, God uses our waiting to transform us. So as we wait, God is with us, making us and forming us to be more his image bearers than we were before. God's sanctifying us, transforming us in such a way that we are blameless before his second coming, as our Thessalonians passage from this week said. In other words, God doesn't waste our waiting. God doesn't waste your waiting. He uses it to be transformative. I read a, a book uh, for a class that I taught a couple years ago, and it was called The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. Crazy title. But it, the, the, the premise of the book was this, that the thing that made the early church grow and explode with uh, multiplication uh, wasn't because they had great buildings, because they had none. It wasn't because they had great pastors, because they had none. Uh, it wasn't because they had a whole bunch of money, because they had none. The thing that made the church explode is they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were patient people. In other words, they lived with patience. Because they truly believed that God was in control, that God was guiding history, that God was coming, and he would renew all things. So they were very patient people. They knew that God was going to take care of them. I'm not a patient person. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, we live in a culture of anxiety. We're driven to worry. We are not patient people. But what if, friends, what if during this season of Advent, God wants to form patience in you? That while you're waiting for Christmas and while you're waiting for all those other things that you're waiting for, because I know we're all waiting for something. We're waiting for a prodigal to come home, right? We're waiting for this relationship to be fixed. We're waiting for this job situation to work out. We're all waiting for something, right? Maybe God wants to use this waiting time almost like a school to form us to be patient. Can you become more patient? Can God form in you more Christ-likeness than when you were before Advent began? Allow that to be a challenge to you. So we wait in hope. We wait in hope because God is with us. That's what Advent reminds us of. Advent reminds us that we are waiting in hope because God is with us, Emmanuel. So the 12 days of Christmas are at the end of our journey this Advent season. And so I have a little bit of a challenge for you. And I, I've been challenging myself for years with this. Can we allow this waiting, this, for, this season of Advent, of, of waiting, can we, um, at the end of this, party for 12 days? Can you? Can you allow your presence with your family and friends to extend beyond that hour when you open presents together? Can you schedule something uh, fun every day during those 12 days to keep the party going and celebrate uh, the presence of Jesus with us? Here's an idea. Parents, and I know kids will hate this idea, so kids, block your ears. I'm speaking to the parents right now. Uh, can we take the gifts and extend them over those 12 days and not open them all at once. Kids are like, no way. I want them all, and I want them now. But can we prolong the celebration beyond an hour? Because if you're like me, after you open the presents, it seems kind of a letdown, doesn't it? Can we schedule like one night during the 12 days Maybe either if you have four people in your family, maybe, maybe four nights are each of your favorite meals. Maybe you have game nights scheduled. Maybe you watch favorite movies, but you are intentional to spend time together. Presence is greater than present. Can this 12 days of Christmas, is at the end of our Advent journey, can this be that demonstration of presence? and memory-making that you long to have? Because I can't tell you any presents I got last year. I can't tell you the presents I got the year before. Probably if I think long and hard, I might come up with a few. 
But what I do remember, presence. What next step is God asking you to take today based on this message about hope? Maybe it's the 12 days of Christmas. Maybe as a family you sit down and try to figure out how to make the party go longer than a day. By the way, 12 in biblical numerology means a perfect length of time. 12 equals a perfect length of time. So it's not about the 12 days. It's not celebrating perfectly the, the birth of Jesus. But the 12 days is there to remind us of that. Maybe your next step is something specific to you based on where you're at in your journey. But I have a challenge here of another way to uh, take a next step, and it's this. Um, what if you would spend at least 10 minutes a day this next week reading Scripture? What if you would spend at least 10 minutes a day reading Scriptures this next week? You could use your new intersection guides. You could use your devotional guide as a way to spend time with the presence of Jesus, helping you become more present to the people around you in your life. Imagine what would it be like if every person that calls Sandy Hook home, if we would shift from worry to hope. And what if this next season, these four Sundays that we wait, we wait for the birth of Christ, we wait for the second coming of Jesus, that we wouldn't give in to despair that we see in the world around us as creation is unraveling, but instead we would live in hope for God's second coming and the renewal of all things. What if we would cultivate God's presence in our life on a day-by-day -day basis in such a way that we live more patiently with the people around us? What if? Let us pray together. We thank you, Lord, for this Advent season. We find ourselves between the arrivals, between the Advent. We live in between. And when we take a look at the world around us, we see creation unraveling. We see creation going backwards. Things are being destroyed. These are signs of the times. These are signs to remind us of the mess that humanity has made of the world. But we don't live in despair, Lord. Remind us to be people of hope looking forward to the second coming. Help us to be people of hope realizing that you're with us every moment of every day as we wait. And help us to understand that what you do inside of us, this transformation to help us become more patient people, is more important than the things that we're waiting for. Help us to realize that presence is greater than presence. Help us to be people who spend time in your word, being soaked in your presence on a day-by-day -day basis. Help us to be people who live in hope. We thank you, Father, for all that you are and all that you do for us. And now as we sing to you, as we worship to you, may this song be a prayer to you, we pray in Christ's name. And everybody said,